Fourth, the universal ethic of reason. The secularism stemming from the Enlightenment has been unable to keep its promise of forging a universal consensus in an ethic based on reason alone. This circumstance seems to be what Nietzsche meant when he observed that no man of reason should rejoice in the death of God. Experience will soon show, he was certain, that with the death of God arrives the death of reason. There's no longer a north star. Why would you say this is true and this is false? Or this is good and this is bad? And in fact, that's what is represented in the philosophers when they turn to things such as the emotive uh, principle of ethics that, uh, as uh, Alastair McIntyre points out, so many ethical arguments are these days among philosophers consist of stating a proposition and saying, boo. And the other side says, states a proposition and says, hooray. You know, it's very hard for them to make an argument about why this is true or not. We believe in, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, I know there are philosophers at the University of Virginia who don't, do not believe their truths, let alone self-evident ones, let alone ones they're prepared to say they believe. The whole question of truth is up to you. Well, that's, what, that's why Zarathustra wept at the death of God, not rejoiced. Fifth, human suffering, tragedy, and evil. Secularism is not altogether speechless when it speaks of death and sin and human suffering and meaningless human tragedy. But what has it actually what does it actually say to the vulnerable that it has not learned from Judaism and Christianity? There are many Jews and Christians who are unfaithful to their own belief and who obviously don't practice what they say they believe. And at the same time, there are many atheists who, while they claim that there is no God and there is no fourth uh, star morally, um, are willing to sacrifice their lives to save their brothers or sisters, like Dr. Mia in the play. or work for the oppressed of the earth, or speak up, go out on arduous uh, protestations when the rights of somebody around the world are being put. And sometimes you find more atheists there than you find um, believers. So it's pretty hard. I mean, we have to be careful judging here. We're going to have to let God sort all this out. People whose actions don't go along with the chaos or nihilism of their beliefs, and people whose actions don't go along with the order and truth they claim to profess, but don't actually manifest in their actions. Now, there are two upcoming crises that uh, need to be worried about in the, the world of secularism. Take, take the world of, of uh, Europe, Western Europe, for example. What are the long-term prospects of existing secular societies? Two stand out. Islamo, Islamo fascism. What can relativism arm itself with what can relativism arm itself in its own defense? Since they have no standard of moral truths, some of the most sensitive members of the secularist community cannot help trying to quote, understand people who are trying to murder them. See why they think it's all right to murder them. And end up pleading for better understanding, tolerance, and pacification as if their murderers cared. Or didn't see that itself as a sign of weakness that deserving of death. Um, so it's hard you know, from a secular humanist framework. I thought, look, there are lots of brave secular humanists who are willing to fight for liberty. And some are leading now the fight against terrorism. But there are an awful lot, too, whose philosophy leads them that just unmanned an arm. They mean well, but they're not prepared to fight. Um, 
Demography. Secularism seems to give no motive to young men and women to have children in sufficient numbers to reproduce themselves, plus a little more to allow for future growth. Whether out of perceived moral duties to the environment, or fears of overpopulation, or simply a preference for enjoying a relatively carefree life. These all seem to be motives for not having children. Uh, and Europe is not reproducing itself. The people in Europe who are having children, more than three or four, are religious people, mostly Muslim, but also Christians and Jews who are faithful, who are churchgoers or synagogue goers, observant. That's where the children are being. Secular people are diminishing themselves by underpopulation, disappearing from history. Now, another thing to turn to is, eighth in, in my list, science needs supportive habits. If everything is meaningless and there is no truth, then what do you anchor the teaching of habits in when you go to teach children or young people? Science is not just a methodology, it requires a set of habits, it requires a culture. This culture forms many students ready for commitment, for discipline, and hard work. If you're going to become a biologist or a chemist, you're going to have to do a lot of hard work, a neurologist. You're going to have to push your minds into areas of abstraction which are very difficult to follow, which would be the envy of any scholastic theologian. And you're going to have to give up a soft life for many hours of your day. So the life of reason is as much a culture as it is a method. Now a great many persons and institutions must be committed to its disciplines, its aims, and its long-term support. The humanist in all things seeks reasons while insisting that at bottom there are no reasons is tangled in self-contradiction. Now my daughter, when she went away to college, was, she later told us, considered herself a, an agnostic or a, an atheist but a non-militant one. Uh, but she went to uh, a very good, why don't I just say it? She went to Duke. <laughs> and, but at Duke, as said everywhere else, the common public assumption is there is no God. I mean, nobody speaks of him. And if you are devout, and many, many people there are, you don't speak about it. It would seem hmm, a faux pas to do that. And, and so the atmosphere is, and my daughter thought, I've got professors who are insisting on rigorous methods and rigorous argumentation and finding evidence and so forth. Who are practicing a profound commitment to reason and all its habits. And yet they think that reason has no reasons. That world order is simply chaos and chance, for which reason has no purchase. We just happen to be here by sheer accident. And she found that an insuperable contradiction, at least for herself. how to spend so much time being reasonable and urging people to be reasonable and saying it's all meaningless. It just, it just didn't add up. So she started out calling herself then an agnotheist. <laughs> she believed there must be a God, but she didn't know what that meant, uh, what possible meaning would it have, which is a different set of problems. Now, the question which most troubled Habermas, point number nine, is how can a small island of people committed to reason and to science long survive in a great ocean of people who see in science and reason engines of demoralization and cultural decadence? And we shouldn't underestimate how many people in the world think that. And it's our very science and commitment to reason that has made the West, that, from their point of view, a decadent, uh, immoral, uh, civilization, unattractive civilization. 